short-termism is in the long run a disastrous approach to life. It can be so hard to plan ahead or to have a long-term big picture in mind as we live our daily lives. But long-term vision is essential, as essential in life as it is on any journey, where we need to know not only where to plant our feet or which way to turn at the next junction, but where our destination is and in which direction should we be looking to make progress. We used to plan journeys by looking at maps and having an idea of the overall route before we started. Now, most of us tend to put the destination into a sat-nav and only think one step at a time. So if sat-nav crashes, we're left helpless. Sometimes the short term has to take over our thinking and action. A child steps out into the road and we swerve to avoid them rather than sticking to our plan of not turning till we get to the junction. Coronavirus threw a spanner in the works of many of our plans and we had to respond in an environment of uncertainty, unable to plan very far ahead because by the time we get to the next month, so much might have changed again. With hindsight, we may criticise the government's approach at the start of the crisis, but at the time, we couldn't see any better than they could what was coming and how it would be. In last week's prophecy, Isaiah spoke to both the long horizon and the short term. Eventually, he said, Egypt would be included in God's people, but for now, don't make an alliance with them, he told the leaders of Judah. In the short term, Egypt would be under God's judgment. In today's oracle, Isaiah speaks to Jerusalem. He calls it the Valley of Vision, a puzzling phrase. Normally a mountaintop is where you have longer vision. And Jerusalem is on the top of a hill, so the title Valley of vision is ironic. A valley can be a dark place like the 23rd Psalms valley of the shadow of death and maybe Isaiah felt he was in a dark place like that as the Lord gave him a vision about Jerusalem and its future. He highlights four mistakes that could be seen in Jerusalem in his day, all of them arising from a short-sighted outlook. Before we come to those mistakes and look at chapter 22, let's just notice a couple of things from the chapter we missed out in our readings, chapter 21. First, it has an enigmatic heading as well, like today's oracle, the desert by the sea. Puzzling at first sight, as was the Valley of Vision. Chapter 21 is again about Babylon, which is in a fertile alluvial plain, well watered down by the sea but it would be judged by God and become a desert. Then there's the prophecy about Edom in verse 11. Watchman, what's left of the night? As though the questioner has woken up, it's still dark, and just as we might look at the clock to see what stage of the night we're at, he asks the watchman who's been awake, how long till morning? A bit like the children in the back seat asking, are we nearly there? My parents used to give us riddles for an answer to that question. And Isaiah the watchman replies, morning is coming, but also the night. If you would ask, then ask and come back yet again. The meaning of it seems to be that the nations are misunderstanding their troubled times and asking, where is everything going? as greater darkness and uncertainty envelop them. How much longer will this night last? The answer is an unspecified time of waiting. Release will come, but there's more darkness to be endured first. It strikes me that this is illustrated in our present situation of lockdown continuing for a limited but unknown time. And all of that in turn illustrates the big sweep of history where we know morning will come. We know Christ will return, but we don't know when. 
And until then, there is more darkness, suffering and death to endure as we wait with hope. The New Testament book of Hebrews calls that hope an anchor for the soul. That long term view, knowing Jesus is coming again and going to put everything right, equips us for enduring life's storms. So what are the four mistakes made in Jerusalem? Back to Isaiah chapter 22. The first one is celebrating short term deliverance, but refusing to accept what lies ahead. Here's a bit of history we'll read later on in Isaiah sometime. Chapters 36 to 37, where the Assyrians, having defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and invaded Judah, besieged Jerusalem 20 years later. Those chapters are duplicated in 2 Kings 18 and the incident also described in 2 Chronicles. They relate a very important event in the life of God's people. Isaiah foretells a rescue and his prophecy is fulfilled in Isaiah 37, 36. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Maybe that was what the people were celebrating in Isaiah 22, when the people have gone up on their roofs, the town full of commotion, a city of tumult and revelry. Then Isaiah's field of vision suddenly changes and he talks about the revelry being turned to shame. He's talking about the future, but he's using the perfect tense. Your leaders have fled together. Whereas in English that normally represents an action in the future, uh, in the past time, in Hebrew, Isaiah is using the prophetic perfect tense, describing what he has seen in his vision of the future, which is sure to heaven, sure to happen, and has already happened in his vision. Though Judah had been delivered, God would sadly hand them over to the Babylonians who would besiege and defeat Jerusalem in 597 BC, leading to its destruction 10 years later. It's the terrible thing you can read about in 2 Kings 24. That's why Isaiah is weeping bitterly in verse 4 of today's reading. And what about us? Do we have big celebrations over small short-term victories whilst burying our heads in the sand about the long-term future. I don't claim to have the vision for how bad things will be socially, politically or economically as we move into what people keep calling the new normal. Maybe we should have more celebration over the survival of the NHS and the fall in infection rates and death rates. Or maybe there's worse to come. I don't know. But what the Lord has revealed to me, and to you as well, if you read his word, is an eternal perspective. You can't get more long term than that. And the long term future for those who don't know the Lord Jesus, the Saviour, is desperately grim. There may be things that we can do to help our community's short-term needs and we can rejoice over any reduction in poverty, improvement in education, progress in addressing mental health issues, breakthroughs in medical research. But the thing that brings rejoicing in heaven, Jesus tells us, is when a sinner repents. The long-term future for any believer in Jesus is wonderfully bright. Any church needs to remember this as we respond to the needs of society. There are short-term needs and there are long-term needs. 
There's a danger of churches in this country taking our eye off the ball as we support the government's message to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Of course, we must support that. But that, the short term thing, is not all. We have something greater to offer as well because we can see the long term need. Saving lives or postponing death would be another way to put it, is not our big long term goal. We have something to offer the world that is far more valuable, the gospel of Jesus, which saves lives beyond death. The second mistake Isaiah saw being made in Jerusalem was looking to human plans and resources, but not acknowledging God as their supplier. The big achievement of King Hezekiah, for which he is remembered, is his tunnel. You can still uh, walk along it under the old city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah's tunnel is half a kilometre long with a gradient of 0.1%. It was hewn out of solid rock by teams of labourers with pickaxes from both ends of the tunnel who somehow met in the middle. Nobody's quite sure how they managed to do it, maybe by tapping on the rock and listening for each other's hammers. It was an engineering marvel and brought Jerusalem a great sense of security. Its purpose was to bring water from the protected Gihon Spring to the lower pool in the city and then have its overflow drain away into the porous rock rather than out into the valley as it was previously flowing. So if an enemy besieged the city, those inside could last for ages with fresh water whilst the attackers had no access to water. It was a defensive masterstroke. Scholars reckon it was done in less than four years, maybe as little as nine months. Maybe it's possible that the revelry in Isaiah 22 verse 2 was celebration when those two teams of diggers met in the middle. At the same time, with the Assyrians looming and threatening to besiege, Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem frantically shored up their defences. They cannibalised people's houses, we read in verse 10, knocking them down to get the stone to bolster the city walls. With walls, weapons and a water supply, who needed anything else? Well, that was their problem. What looked like engineering and strategic prudent brilliance was their ultimate folly. God had promised to protect them. When he gave the city to his people in the first place, God knew what water supply he had created for it. Hezekiah didn't create the water, he diverted it. Jerusalem became locked down into this near horizon of their own activism, which became the enemy of faith. There's nothing wrong with activity and, and technology itself, nothing wrong with strategic thinking. But the people were using their God-given gifts but the problem was they were relying on those gifts and forgetting God's promises. So we need to ask ourselves, do we have this kind of limited vision and DIY activist salvation? As long as I've got my health, that's the main thing, we say. But that is not the main thing. Or, I just need to provide for my family and earn enough money to give them a secure future. We can't give them a secure future anyway. The best gift we can give our children and grandchildren is knowledge of the Lord Jesus, who can give them a secure future for eternity. The third mistake Isaiah saw in Jerusalem happened when people finally realised how desperate their situation was for the future. Fatalistic feasting in the, mis in the face of danger, but no repenting and seeking God's mercy. 
Have a look at verse 12. The Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. Whereas in the second mistake we saw activism and a denial of faith, now we see escapism, which is a denial of repentance. Oh, there's nothing we can do. God's punishing us. We're going to die, the people in Jerusalem were saying correctly. So let's enjoy what we have left of life. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Wrong. They had been ignoring God. Now they are still ignoring God. Was there nothing they could do? Well, do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah went to that wicked city, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, with the message from God. Forty more days and Nineveh was destroyed. That's all that the book of Jonah tells us his message was. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There was nothing that they could do, the people of Nineveh, to stop this judgment coming. And yet what did they do? They repented and cried out for God's mercy. And God loves to show mercy. That's what the Lord is like. That actually was what annoyed a peevish prophet Jonah. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So what should the people of Jerusalem have done when they realised the city walls and the water tunnel weren't going to save them and there was nothing they could do to save themselves? They should have cast themselves on God's mercy. As Rahab the prostitute did when Jericho was destroyed and she and her family were saved. God loves to show mercy. He loves to treat us better than we deserve. Yes, he's a holy God and he does punish and we can't get ourselves out of that. But he is compassionate and merciful. We just need to turn back to him as our king and ask for his mercy. Jesus died so we could become God's friends. It's never too late unless we keep refusing the offer of his mercy. Sometimes I think the church today collaborates with the world's escapism, where the world says, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. People don't want to hear about sin and forgiveness, we're told. They want to be uplifted and feel good about themselves the way they are. But if we shut up about sin and forgiveness, if we deprive people of the offer of life, we encourage them into this attitude of escapism, even when they're starting to recognise their desperate position before God. We owe it to everyone to introduce them to God's mercy. The fourth error in Jerusalem, building a name and reputation for oneself but not recognising one's total dependence on the Lord. And I think this was probably a widespread attitude in Jerusalem, but one, one individual exemplified this attitude uh, seen in Jerusalem. His name was Shebna. He was in charge of the palace. We find that Hezekiah's tunnel wasn't the only expression of faithlessness hewn into solid rock under the city. Shebna's love of pomp went as far as planning a tomb for himself fit for a king. In contrast, another court official called Eliakim shows the characteristics of a true leader. And we read that God um, deposed Shebna and installed Eliakim in his place. Look at how they, these two men compare. Shebna was self-regarding. 
you could see that in, in his chariots and his tomb, whereas Eliakim is described as the servant of the Lord. Shebna is, is like a ball, unstable, God's going to throw him away. Eliakim is like a peg, stable, God's going to fix him in the solid wall and people can and hang up on it as a solid, dependable person. Shebna would then be disgraced and Eliakim honoured. Shebna would be deposed by the Lord, Eliakim fixed in a firm place by the Lord. Verse 23. So Eliakim is in so many ways so ideal as a leader. So there's a sad surprise in verse 24. I wonder if you felt the shock of it as we as Jan read it to us. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. Maybe it's his own weakness. Maybe it's the failings of his family who hang on his glory like heavy items on a peg on the wall. But Eliakim is not up to the job of bearing the full weight of government of God's people. This happens all through the Old Testament. You keep getting what looks like an ideal leader and they turn out to be flawed. Isaiah's already told us back in chapter seven what we need. The, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. His name means God with us. When he comes, Isaiah sees in chapter nine, to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The people of Jerusalem needed Emmanuel. We need Emmanuel. Thank God he has sent us exactly what we need, or rather exactly who we need. God is with us. Emmanuel is Jesus.